Hey, welcome to Gateway Church and First Conference. It's going to be a great service. You know, I, I just want to encourage us to have a, an expectant heart that God's going to do something in this service. Do you believe that, that God's going to do something in this service? No matter where you are, whether you're here in this house or online or one of our, our prison campuses, let's have expectant hearts. You know, when Jesus went back into Nazareth, into his hometown, the scripture said he was unable to do many miracles because of their unbelief. Another way of saying it is they weren't expecting anything from him. But I want us to raise our expectation and believe that God's gonna do something mighty, that Jesus is here, he is with you no matter where you are. Lord, we give you this service, we give you our, our lives this time. May worship arise to your throne that honors you and blesses you. In Jesus' name and all of God's children say, amen. Spirit out, pour your spirit out. 
spirit out. God, pour your spirit out. Come pour your spirit out. Oh, we need you, Lord. Oh, we need you, Father.
Do you remember in the word when God promised to Abraham to make him a great nation? He said, I'm gonna bless you, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky through your son Isaac that will be born to you. And it's a beautiful promise. But did you know that his son Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was barren? She was barren. There was no hope for the promise. God said, I'm gonna make you a great nation, but his son's wife is barren. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. You may have a promise from God today. You may know what he said over your life. You may be believing for it, but there may be an area of your life that's barren. It's a desert that you don't see that there's a way for the promise to come to pass. And I promise you, there is no other way except through Jesus. He is the way. And just like Isaac prayed in the face of a broken promise, he said, Lord, help. Lord, come. Lord, do whatever it is that you want. Whatever it is that he prayed. And God answered his prayer. Your breakthrough is on the other side of your prayer. So church, can we cry out to the Lord? Our heart and our flesh, he is so good. He is so faithful. And he answers our prayers. He's faithful to his word. We love you, Lord. We trust you. We cry out to you now. We cry out to you. We believe you, Lord. You come through on your word. You come through, Lord. trust in you. And we declare the name of Jesus over our lives, over every situation. You are good. Be exalted, Lord. Can you just say that now? Just be exalted, Lord. Be enthroned upon our praise. You are worthy. You are holy. You are awesome. You are great.
Aren't you grateful for that name? Aren't you grateful for that person? Come on, let's shout his name one more time. Jesus! 
Well, this is a great new year already. We've had a great conference already. We still have more. But you know, in a new year, there's always a new opportunity, uh, new, new uh, ambitions that we may have. But you know what also comes with that always is new failures, new frailty, new faults. But you know what? That's not the thing we're going to look to. We're going to look to the name of Jesus. We're going to look to the work that he's done on the cross. And you know, no matter what you go through this year, I want to remind you of something. And don't you ever forget it. Isaiah 53, 5 says this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. It's already been done. You don't need to sweat it off. Aren't you grateful that the finished work on the cross is finished? When he said it is finished, he meant what he said, and he says what he means. It is finished. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Hey, if you need peace, he's already taken it for you. He can give you peace right now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what failure, fault, no matter what, his peace is there. And with his stripes, we are healed. I want you to claim that in your life tonight because we are claiming the name of Jesus over our family, over our lives. Come on, let's declare his name right now. We declare your name, Jesus, over all the things that concerning our life this year. We declare that 2023 is the year of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is your year. Lord, we thank you for a new anointing, for a new day. Thank you for healing. Right now, I declare healing. I feel like I'm supposed to declare healing over liver disease. In Jesus' name, over cataracts, in Jesus' name, over gout, over depression, over kidney failure, I declare the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that with your stripes, we are healed. We thank you for this year, Lord, what you're going to do in our lives and in our families' lives. And we declare liberty and freedom because of the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Well, welcome to Gateway Church. Why don't you turn around, greet one another. Let someone know you're glad to see them here in this place. You know that God has placed a call on your life to serve the church. God has given you giftings and a heart for people. You may be a student, a pastor, or in a season called the in-between. Let us develop what God has destined you to do at the Gateway Ministry Experience. Good to see you. Well, I have to admit that after Sammy Rodriguez this weekend, I didn't think it could get better. And then after Michael Todd, I didn't think it could get better. And then after Jensen Franklin, 
I didn't think it could get better. And I know our speaker, and I know she loves God, and I know she's incredible, but the most amazing thing is with Jesus, it always gets better. And Jesus is here. So it's going to be great. I just uh, want to let you know tomorrow night, Let's finish strong. I've been I'm so proud of you for the way you've attended in person. And if you haven't been able to attend in person, online. Um, so, but tomorrow night, Derwin Gray. Derwin has been at our pastor's conferences. I don't think he's ever been here on the weekend that I can re- I remember. Anyone remember? Okay. So I don't think you've gotten to hear him yet. But uh, Derwin played in the NFL and then went to seminary and pastors a church. And Derwin has become a voice in our nation. And you, you don't want to miss tomorrow night. And we are actually doing something special tomorrow night because Wednesday night is normally students. So we are asking, we are joining tomorrow night with our student ministry. All right? So... So that's going to be a very special night, all right? So Lisa is here tonight. We do have, uh, she's written so many books, only God knows how many books she's written. Um, But we have two of her books uh, in the bookstores that you can pick up. And so they're just two right here, New York Times best-selling author. And uh, of course, you can go online and Amazon and pick up any of her books And the only reason I ever say that is not to sell books, and she knows that. She's not doing it for that. She's writing another one right now. She doesn't write books to sell books. She does it to help people. And so that's the reason I tell you about uh, these books. She really needs no introduction. She's been here so many times. She was at our first women's conference ever, and we didn't think there was any way that we could get Lisa Bevere, you know. Uh, But she came. uh, Debbie and I interviewed her one time. James and Betty, we y- y'all were sick or or vacationing or something, you know. And so you asked Debbie and I to host, and we got to interview Lisa. That's where we met her on Life Today. So um, anyway, uh, and John, her husband, John, will be here later uh, this year speaking. We try to have him every year or two as often as we can. Uh, but Lisa, obviously internationally known teacher, preacher, speaker, uh, author. Please welcome Lisa Bevere. Well, hello, Gateway. Wow. And and I hear there's more of you than what is even here in the building. So I want to say hi to all the campuses and to everybody online. You know, when we come here, John and I feel like we are surrounded by family and friends. Thank you so much for coming and leaning in on a Tuesday night. I am so jealous that you got to be with all of these other ministers. I procrastinated on a deadline, and so I had to be home alone with my laptop. I want to show you a picture of my family because since I was here last, my family has expanded. So my only single son, Alexander, got married to this beautiful Australian. He held off as long as he could because he knew as soon as he got married that my popularity would plummet. He was like, mom, if you can't be auctioning off sons anymore, people are not gonna come hear you. But he, he held off and finally he was like, I, I need to do this. And so this is what my family looked like shortly after I was here last in June. But we added another grandbaby. I think you can see somebody is pregnant. Well, there's, that's Scarlett. Now, Scarlett is amazing. She is super smart. She's 18 months and she cannot walk. Now, she can physically possibly walk, but her thighs are so much bigger than her feet that she can't get like steady. So she's walked like maybe 15 steps, but then she just drops and just goes for it. So that is Scarlett. And then we've got Azariah Jax. There's Azariah. Azariah looks like he has a baby wig on. He was born with a ton of hair, conceived in Venice, Italy. We finally have a child who looks Italian. 
I'm so happy about that. I don't know if you know how connected Gateway is with what is happening all over the world. I have seen the generosity of Gateway all the way in, in the, reflected in the people of Iran. You guys have sown so significantly, so consistently. And we have an app that's a discipleship app that has now reached over 1 million users. And a lot of those languages have been sponsored by your church. We have 132 languages in discipleship. Yeah, you need, to, you need to do a praise God on that. And it's completely free because of the partnership we have with you guys. So we're always just so honored and so blessed with that. Okay, I did mention Italian. I, I need to be really clear. You're gonna have John, I believe it's in July. John is Italian and I am Sicilian. And there's a little bit of a difference between Italians and Sicilians. Italians are known for feeding people. Sicilians are known for killing people. So we have a little bit of a different uh, preaching style, parenting style, everything style. But uh, I hope you know that I am a grandmother of six and a mother to four men. And what I have in my heart for the next generation is I believe that the millennials and the Gen Zs are going to experience an outpouring of the Spirit of God. I believe that the, other, the older people are gonna be like, wait a minute. I believe that God is going to do something. And I say something, because we don't have words for the thing that He is going to pour out on this next generation. And I know, I know the year has changed, but God has not changed. And God has a plan even when the enemy has a scheme. And God is not step back nervous about anything. God is saying, I'm going to astound this world with my glory, with my presence, with my power. I love how you worship tonight. And I hope that even as you were worshiping tonight, you were asking because the Spirit of God is asking His people to ask for revival ask for the outpouring, ask for signs and wonders and miracles. We cannot draw back because we've been weary in well-doing. We need to lean forward and ask. And I wanna kind of punctuate our time. A few years back, I read a quote by William Booth. And this is what he said when he was asked, what do you see as a challenge for the next 100 years? He said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. I feel like we are there right now. But guess what? You were woven for this moment in time. And somewhere along the line, we all got this idea that we could be heroes without a battle. I don't know if it was social media likes that we were like, whoa, I'm a hero. Look at how many people liked this post. Well, I'm gonna tell you this right now, that is a pretend world. And every time I go to bed at night, I turn off my phone and I say, goodbye, pretend world, and I put it down. <laughs> I, I, I love that I have the ability to speak to a lot of people I'd never have a chance to, but the real world and the people that you can see are the people that God wants to have you touch their life. And I get it, it's so much easier. I can post something and people are like, oh, Lisa, you are so profound. And then my husband comes in. He's like, what, why are you, what, what's for dinner? I mean, I'm like, you don't understand. I am profound. People are like, do you want to see what people are saying about me? No, he does not want to see what people are saying about me. God actually is asking us if we want to be popular or influential. And they are two very different things. Popular means common. Influential means powerful. And it's very hard to have both of those things at once. 
But we are going to have to decide that we want to be influential people, people of God, people who understand that we were handpicked for this time. And I, I listen to parents and they, they say things like, man, it's so scary raising kids right now. Well, I understand that. But see, God actually handpicked your children for this time period. And we don't want to be like the children of Israel and speak fears over our children. We want to actually go in with them. We want to bless them. We want to say it's going to be the old and the young. It's going to be the men and the women. It's going to be the visions and the dreams. It's going to be the outpouring of God's spirit. Because see, we have the best communicators on the face of the earth right now. But I am not interested in words without the weight of God's spirit. Because when we have words weighted by God's spirit, it changes everything. Are you with me on this? I feel like you are or you wouldn't be here on a, a Tuesday night. So here's our day. We have a day where everybody thinks they can have their own truth. You can have a truth. They can have a truth. Everybody has my truth. Well, that doesn't really work because we have a generation that thinks their feelings are truth. And as a 62, almost 63 year old woman who has been through menopause, I'm going to tell you right now, Feelings will lie to you. They will take you emotional hostage. They will say things like, punch your husband in the face. You cannot allow your feelings to be the truth. And when people say, what is truth? They're asking the wrong question. Because truth is not a what. Truth is a who. Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And people were like, I don't think it should be that exclusive. Well, he says, come, everyone, anyone that have nothing, have everything, come, come. It's an open invitation, but it is a narrow way. A narrow way. It's his way. It's not my way. It's not your way. It's his way. We have forgotten that truth is a rock. It is not a river that changes and ebbs and flows at different times and feelings. We act like our culture has gotten better. I'm sorry. I've never seen us so crazy. Every once in a while, I'm like, I think I live in crazy town now. I am like, as soon as I think it's not going to get crazier, it gets crazier. And I want to say something to all the men. As a mother of four sons, I love men, and I am so sorry that our culture has said things like toxic masculinity, because God actually <laughs> likes men, and God likes men to act like men. Now, I get it. There's toxic behavior that some men might have. I love that women are standing up going, yeah. Okay, but there's toxic women behavior as well. Just talked about wanting to punch my husband in the face. Okay, but, but God created us male and female in his image. And I don't know where we thought he said, blend the image. We need men to be men and we need women to be women. And we need to remember again, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And our culture has sexualized what it means to be a woman. And sometimes I have to look at my own gender and think, did we mishandle what it means to be a woman? Did I play on to that and say, well, I'll just, I'll be about appearances. But being a woman is a gift from God. It is a entrustment to partner with God, to bring forth life in a lot of different areas, not just birthing children. And God created man to reflect his glory. 
And God created male and female to be a power union, not a power struggle. This idea that we need to push the men aside or push the women aside, that is the enemy. That is the enemy trying to divide houses so they will fall. So we have a culture that has pushed back on truth, redefined truth, makes themselves the truth. We're actually becoming a culture that is very pagan. We worship creation. We worship ourselves instead of the creator. Romans talks about it, says, worse followed, refusing to worship God. They soon forgot how to be human. Men forgot how to be men, and women forgot how to be women. When we do not press into God, we lose our humanity. I have never seen people so cruel and so inhumane. But guess what? When I read the book of Hebrews, I used to get excited. I used to be like, wait a minute. These people who through faith toppled kingdoms, made justice work and took the promises for themselves. I used to get excited about being a warrior for God. And you know what? We've had some ease until now. And we live in a day and a time where there's a little bit of a struggle. It's not so popular to be a Christian anymore. And we're going to have to understand that struggle is actually strengthening. And the church always flourishes in hardship more than it does in prosperity. So I'm going to bring you a message out of the book of James because I thought it would be appropriate for our season. I'm going to read it out of the message paraphrase, but it's pretty much bad news in every single <laughs> version. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way, adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. That is a lot. So let's break this down. First of all, it opens up with considered a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. That doesn't sound like a gift to me. That sounds like a nightmare. I mean, when you are surrounded by tests and challenges, I, I get it, like one's in front, and then you go beyond that one, and then there's another one. But James is actually saying it's a pure gift when you are completely surrounded by tests and challenges at all sides. That's where we are right now. The, the nicer version said, consider it pure joy, not mixed with any sorrow. So what I want to propose is that our God sees ambushes without any means of escape to be an opportunity for him to show himself strong. So if you're feeling a little bit surrounded right now, I want you to know, I believe that God is unlocking some things. When we were in worship, I heard the Holy Spirit say, there are people in this room that they have been locked up. And I am unlocking something that has been locked up in their life. And the thing is, you didn't want it to come this way, but the unlocking is going to come through how you respond to the tests and challenges. He goes on to say, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. I know that. I know that under pressure, I don't always like who I become. Like, have you ever gone to get a massage? And when you go into the massage, 
They're like, what do you want? Do you want light, medium, or deep tissue? I want to be bruised the next day. I want every penny of my money to show up on my body. I'm like, give me deep pressure. I want elbows, I want knees. I've had people climb on me. John, on the other hand, falls asleep. I'm like, how in the world can you fall asleep during a massage? Well, John's like, I I don't wanna hurt during a massage. I'm trying to relax during a massage, but I like pressure. But you know what they tell me in the massage? If this is too much pressure, we'll back off. That's not what happens with this scripture. That's not what happens. It actually forces your faith life into the open. Now, I have lived in Colorado for a really long time. I'm in Nashville Nashville now for just a year. If I start having an accent, you'll know it'll be longer. But I, in Colorado, we can basically grow things for two months. And if you want to grow something that is not native to that climate, you have to create an artificial climate. And so I would go out to Home Depot and I would buy these bulbs and I would put them in my refrigerator drawer. And I would say, rest easy, my friends. You are having a mild, maybe southern winter. And when it should be spring, but we had three feet of snow on the ground, I would put them out on the windowsill. It's a process called forcing them. And God is creating environments for his people to bloom under pressure. Under pressure, you find out the faithfulness of God. Under pressure, you actually find out what you are really made of. Under pressure, you find out that you're stronger in him than you know. And under pressure, you got to cry out for his strength. And I love the promise of God. It says, the moment I cried out, you stepped in and made my life strong and large with strength. So I don't know what you're going through right now, but some of you needed to start singing. Then it goes on to say, so don't try to get out of anything prematurely. I'm going to tell you, being a Christian for, I don't know, over 40 years now, married for 40 years, I'm going to tell you this right now. You can back out of a test. You can say, well, you know, I, I, this church, I don't feel like they're acknowledging my gift. I feel like it's just a mega church, and I don't know. I'm not making any friends. Well, there's a bunch of choices. You got a bunch of choices in mega churches to make friends. You can keep transplanting, 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 transplanting. But what happens when you transplant, transplant, transplant? It ends up stunting your growth. The Bible says those that are planted in the house of God will flourish in his courts. I want to see you flourish, not be stunted. And some of you, what you did is you opted out of some things. And I'm going to speak specifically to the last couple years. Some of you had some dreams going into 2020. And what you did was you got disappointed. You got discouraged. And instead of planting some things, you buried them. And there's a difference between planting and burying something. When you bury something, you put it in the ground and you walk away. But when you plant something, you have an expectancy. You tend it, you pray over it, you watch for it, you weed it, you water it. And God is saying that now is the time for you to dig up some of the things you buried in a season of disappointment and begin to plant them, begin to water them, begin to speak life over them things that you backed out of prematurely. In college, I remember there were so many times I did not prepare well for the test at the time. And I always had to take the retest. And the retest is always harder. Learn from me. Take the test the first time rather than the 15th time. Okay. And then he goes on to say, let it do its work. So you can become mature, 
well-developed and not deficient in any way. You know, I have kind of an embarrassing, funny story. I um, went down to Australia many years ago, like, well, not many, but a while ago, a decade ago. And while I was there, somebody made the mistake of telling me that they thought I was buff. And when you tell a woman in her 50s that she's buff, she will want to believe you, even though she knows it's a lie. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm buff. So I actually came home and I told my sons, I said, hey, listen, we're, we're gonna go to the gym. Because somebody told me that I'm buff and that I am almost just like the original Sarah Connor from Terminator. Now, some of you will know who that is, and that is why you're laughing, because you're like, no, Lisa. But I was like, yeah, I, I feel like I'm maybe two training sessions away from her buffness. And so my boys, they made a little pump up thing for me. We go to the gym, and I am all ready to like show how buff I am. I thought the trainer would be impressed when he like saw my muscles. He, was, he wasn't even looking up from his clipboard. He was like, before you work out, we need to do an assessment. I was like, what? An assessment? He's like, yes, I need you to do like jumping jacks for two minutes or something. Well, I was so nervous because I was out in the open. There were people working out that knew what they were doing and he shoves me in the middle. I haven't been in the gym in 20 years at that point and now I'm doing jumping jacks and I'm clapping at the top because I didn't want him to accuse me of cheating and my boys just began to back away like, that's not our mom. We don't know, we don't know who that is, but our, that's not ours. And then he asked me to like, do weights, and I, he gave me like a five-pound weight, and I was like, yeah, and he's like, nope, you didn't do it right. He did some kind of voodoo thing to my arm, and then when I tried to lift it, I couldn't lift it, and I was like, wait, something's wrong, and then he started to take me through all these different courses, and then it ended up at the peak of humiliation, and that was when he decided it was important to measure my fat percentage, and he... <laughs> put this thing that looked like a game controller in my hand. He was like, hold it out in front of you and we're gonna push it and we're gonna get your fat percentage. And basically, I failed it. He was like, wow, you're, that's really high. I was like, yeah, I thought it might be that high. And then he said, well, I said, maybe, maybe I wasn't holding right, let me do it again. So I had him do it again, it went up a percentage point. <laughs> and he began to systematically point out sisters in the gym who were a lot larger than me, but apparently not as fat as me. I guess I had a higher fat percentage than all of these sisters. And he was like, she's, you're fatter than her. You're fatter than her. You know, I was like, okay, wow. I've just come in here thinking I was Sarah Connor. And now you are just telling me that I'm fat. He said, well, you're something we call skinny fat. I'm like, well, why? Why? I told him, I said, listen, you need to hear this right now. I am not some cow potato, couch potato. I just came from Australia. I traveled the world. I am a busy person. I am not a lazy person. He said, oh yeah, you're busy. And that is why you are burning muscle rather than building it. If you want to build muscle, you have to withstand pressure. When things come down on you, you've got to learn how to press up against it. It's a good point. I'm still skinny fat. Anyway, so, <laughs> so you want to let it do its work. The trial, you want it to do its work so you can become mature, well-developed, and not deficient in any way. Then he goes on to say, if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, can I just be honest with you? Half the time, I don't even know where I am let alone what I'm doing. He says, if you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. I think a lot of us think that God is like, really? You're gonna ask me again? I feel like you guys should figure this out by now. You wicked and perverse generation, how long must I stay? No, God actually wants to get involved. And how many of you know that we are in a day and a time that is going to require God's involvement. So we need to ask God, God, help. That's basically all you have to say. And he's like, awesome. Yeah, I love that God says, this is, this is the amazing God that we have. 
that before we even ask, he's already answering. But he waits for us to ask because when we ask, it's a partnership. And I believe that too many of you buried something that you're supposed to be tending now and asking God's blessing, God's direction, God's strategy. See, I believe that we are in a time period where God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. And it says that your sons and your daughters will what? Prophesy. Oh, but we've settled for criticize. No, you're not anointed to criticize. You're anointed to prophesy. And people that prophesy, they're, they're not stupid. They're not saying, oh, there's not a problem. No, prophetic people can see the problem in front of them and the answer behind it. Prophetic people will declare the problem is not an issue. It's just an obstacle. And God will use this obstacle to get us to this answer. And so he will always speak the destiny rather than have you stop where you are right now. I love this, this quote by Winston Churchill because it gives me permission to cuss in church. It says, <laughs> if you are going through hell, you just keep going. You don't set up camp and cry and whine and post on Instagram about how upset you are with your husband or your friends because nobody wants to be with you anymore because you're a whiner. You need to go ahead and just get up and just keep going. We also have to be very careful with our words. People think, well, you know, why do we have to be careful with our words? Well, Proverbs is very clear. I was actually reading this on the plane today, that the perversity of words leads to a perverse path, which ends up in perverse ways. So perversions and all the weirdness, it always begins with words. And you and I are created in the image of God, and he gives us his words. You know, I mentioned that because of the generosity of so many people, we've been able to translate resources in so many languages. And one of the things I've learned is even if we all are speaking a different dialect, we're all supposed to be speaking the same language. And that language is the language of our making. It is the language of the Word of God. If we begin to actually pray the word of God, speak the word of God, read the word of God until it reads you. Don't just do it like, oh, I got to read 18 chapters because I'm four days behind on the reading through the Bible. I would rather you read when you can pause and when you can interact with God's word because God's word is alive. And when the pressure comes down, I want the word of God to come out rather than the words of people. And it isn't about what you tweet. Retweeting doesn't count as reading. Reposting doesn't count as reading. You need to, like, I'm great with you. Win. That's a great one. That's awesome. Share it. Maybe their background is cooler than what you could do. But don't read to get a post. Read to let God build something into your life because I need you to be strong. I need you to not be skinny fat. I need you to be people who aren't just busy, but they can bear up under the weight. So you can ask God for his help. It says you'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. But here's what it says. It says, ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. Let's talk about the boldly, believingly. Have you ever prayed a prayer that as it's coming out of your mouth, your ears are hearing it, you're like, whoa, 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 where, where did that just come from? See, God actually says that we enter his courts, we come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving. It also, you know, I was, this is something I'm, I'm always in, and, and I hope I can un unpack this correctly, and I love that I'm with men and women, but I, my normal is women's meetings. And then it kind of started being that I would sometimes do Sunday mornings. 
but I got a little confused on the Sunday mornings because I, I didn't want to be exercising authority over the men, even though I wasn't doing any church discipline. I was just like teaching. So I was like, I'm trying to do this. So I would say everything like it was a question. And the pastor pulled me aside and he said, I watched you in the women's meeting and you spoke with authority. And then you get up on Sunday morning and you embarrassed me. You act like everything was a question. My people were like, what is, does she know anything? And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never even spoken in my own home church. I don't, you know, and, and he said, well, I just wish you could figure this out. And so I was like, wow. And so I was praying and I was reading and it said that they were amazed by Jesus because he spoke as one who had authority, not like the Pharisees. Pharisees will put a question mark on everything that God wants to put a period or an exclamation mark on. And I believe that we need to speak the word of God because we know the word of God. And it isn't because I have authority, it's because I have his authority. And there's authority attached to the word of God. God. And so when I speak his word, I should speak it, not like it's a question mark. Because how many of you know that Ephesians says God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask, hope, pray, or believe. But we're asking about this big. God's like, I need you to ask boldly. I hear moms they are like, oh God, just keep my kids a virgin until college. Just let them let them not turn gay. Let them not. I mean, I'm like, okay, listen. We do not allow culture to form our prayers. We do not pray in response to culture. We pray in response to kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth in my children as God declares it from heaven. Listen, we're first generation Christians. My children were tortured every single night. I would line them up and I'd say, you are for signs and wonders and miracles. You are not for death and destruction. You are disciples taught of the Lord and great is your peace and undisturbed composure. They were like, what's composure? I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you need it, you will have it. And then they had to do the whole thing like, feet shot. They had to put their armor on to go to bed because I'm not a morning person. So I was like, you will sleep in your armor. This is it. They're like, we just, we just want to be like normal children and wear pajamas. We're like, no, you're sons of the most high God. You don't get to be normal. Well, I wanted to make more room for my boys than had been made for me. And I want to make more room for you than you can even imagine. Because God is not holding out on us. He is not saying, I'm mad at my people. He is saying, I'm waiting for my people to posture themselves in alignment with me. My Bible says, I know your pastor has taught on this so well, my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, turn from their own wicked ways. Instead of trying to turn everybody else's wicked ways, we got to turn from our own wicked ways. God says, I will hear from heaven and I will heal the land. This land needs healing. And it isn't so much about counting election returns. It's about the elect returning. And when the elect return back to God, God's gonna hear. He's bigger than that, people. Okay, he's bigger. We can't, like, when did we think it was about ballots? Hey, my Bible says when the righteous reign, the people rejoice. We are supposed to be the people who are reigning in the spirit. But we gotta stop being mean. You got to stop being mean. You got the, the mean people over here, the, the progressive liberals, but you got the mean Christians too. Oh, they're so excited when anybody falls. They're like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it 10 years ago. They get so excited. They're putting things on social media. Everybody's up. Everybody's happy about other people messing up. That's not how we're supposed to act. 
We're supposed to actually cover one another. It's like the body of Christ has some kind of autoimmune disease where we are attacking ourselves. We need to stop that nonsense. We need to, we need to wash the body of Christ with the water of the word. That's what Jesus does. You can't say, oh, I love Jesus, but I hate his church. I'm sorry, the church is Jesus' bride, and he's not gonna be okay with that. So we need, to, we need to have people that, yeah, let's deconstruct the things that need to be deconstructed. But if you don't have a heart for reconstruction, then you are just an agent of destruction. And so we need to be people who are asking boldly, believingly, without a second thought, people who worry their prayers. We're not gonna be wind-whipped waves. Pray one way when this wind goes this way. Pray this way when this way, the wind goes that way. So I'm going to believe that in all of my Sicilian boldness that you are going to begin to ask. Because even though I don't like how the book of James begins, I do like how it ends. James 4, 7 says, so let God work his will in you. Yell aloud, no, to the devil. So you get loud with the devil. People are like, I don't wanna get loud with the devil. He might get mad. He might come after me. He's already mad. He's already after you. You need to get loud with the devil. Loud with the devil. Yell aloud, no, to the devil. And watch, his scamper, watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God, and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Quit it. Y'all, it's nonsense. This is not the time to be playing around with sin. Quit dabbling in sin. You just say, well, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just watching it. You will never have authority over the things you choose to be entertained by. We have to watch what we are allowing into our households. Quit dabbling in with sin. Okay, quit playing the field. Purify your inner life. So let's get loud. Can I get everybody to stand on your feet right now? You can do this at home. If your kids are in bed, don't get too loud. Okay, but I want you to understand that enough is enough. And God is saying, I need to know if my people are ready to ask me boldly. Well, I've already asked before and it didn't happen. Believingly, without a second thought. Sometimes in my life, I haven't had just the second thought. I've had the third thought, the fourth thought, the fifth thought. I remember John saying, it must be hard to be in your mind. You're so double-minded. I said, I'm triple-minded. You have no idea what all is in here. But then I get a hold of it and I ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. I don't know what you are standing for. I don't know what you are believing for. I don't know what area of your life is presently barren, but I'm going to ask you to cry out to God and believe that He will answer you. So lift up your hands and say, Heavenly Father, I am ready to be loud with the devil. Satan, I'm not gonna dabble anymore. I am committed to purifying my inner life. God, have your way. Pour out your spirit. Astound me with your faithfulness. Give me the courage to ask for the things you want released in this earth. Unlock your promises for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless. Yeah. Come on, let's thank Lisa. Wasn't that a great message? Hey, we're gonna have our prayer team come down now, and as they come down, if you're standing in faith for something, I want you to come down and agree in prayer with us. We wanna agree with you. 
whatever you're standing for, whatever maybe pressure is in your life right now, we wanna agree and stand with you that God's gonna be the overcomer in your life, that you're gonna be the overcomer. So come on, prayer team, if you're a pastor, ministry leader, if you'd come on down right now, we wanna agree with you. As they are coming down, you can come down and let us agree with you and agree with the Lord concerning whatever is concerning you. You don't have to be embarrassed to come down for prayer. We all need prayer. I need prayer from time to time. You don't even need to be a member here at Gateway for Prayer. We would love to agree with you in prayer. So even after this service is over, we're gonna continue to be down here. So come on down. Maybe it's a physical healing. Maybe it's financial, relational, spiritual. Maybe it's a prodigal son, prodigal daughter. No matter what it is, we wanna agree with you together. The the effectual fervent prayer of, of righteous men and women are powerful and effective, and we wanna agree with you in prayer. Aren't you grateful for what the word that uh, Lisa gave tonight? Wasn't that incredible? Hey, tomorrow night's gonna be incredible too. Derwin Gray, seven o'clock tomorrow night. It's gonna be an incredible service tomorrow night. Lord, thank you for what you did in our hearts and our lives. May we glorify you in all that we do, Lord. We take a stand in 2023 that we're gonna live for you, solely for you, Jesus, and our families are yours, our finances are yours, our family, Lord, everything that concerns us, our jobs, Lord, our health, Everything is yours, our relationships, God. We give it to you in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, good night. We'll see you tomorrow night.